Hello and welcome. My name is Raj K and today I'm going to be showing you the R5. The R5 is Canon's most feature rich and technical camera to date. It is also its most customizable. So I'm going to be taking you through everything that this camera can do as well as showing you the physical side of it, the buttons and dials and what they do and taking you through the entire menus. I'll also show you my favorite customization setups for different types of photography be that wildlife or sports photography, uh, as well as possibly landscape and portraiture. There is quite a lot to go through, so grab yourself a cup of tea, settle in, and let's get started. So this is my R5. Um, I've got a little orange L-plate bracket, that's just for putting it on a tripod. Um, so we'll start off with the top of the camera. You can see it there. We have the on-off switch, that's fairly obvious. We've got the hot shoe here, which is for adding flashes. And on the top you'll see you've got quite a lot of buttons, and nearly all of these are customizable. We'll go into the customizing buttons but a little bit later on. But we have, if we turn the camera on, we have the uh, illuminating button. So we just press that to cycle through information on this little top uh, display here. And if you hold the button, it illuminates the panel as well. And you can still cycle through. Um, you've got the record button, and that will automatically go into uh, video mode, even if you're currently st in stills mode. If you don't use the video side of this camera, you can actually customize that button away so that you can use it for something a little bit more uh, practical for yourself. And you have the lock button here. The lock button can be used to lock some of the controls so you don't accidentally lock it and change your exposure, but you can also use it to turn off things like the touch screen um, if you don't use it or you don't want to be able to sort of touch it with your uh, hand while you're doing other things. Um, the mode button on the R5 you'll notice is here rather than a, a physical dial. Just hit that and then cycle through as you would. Um, and then if you want to switch to video mode, once you've hit the mode button, you then press info and it will switch over to the video side. Nice and easy. You'll notice you've got multiple dials here, so this is where this camera differs slightly from the digital SLRs. You've actually got three uh, dials, so you've got one here, one here, and then one on the back there as well, which is great because then you've got all three variables for your ISO, aperture, and your shutter speed at different fingertips makes it making it very quick and easy to make adjustments and uh, and be able to work quicker right up the front we've got a manual function button so if I hit the MFN button it brings up this little menu I can then cycle through the different options on there with the back wheel and then adjust them using the top wheel uh, I tend to use this just for adjusting the ISO uh, or the white balance personally but you know whatever feels comfortable to you we also have um, little anchor points for straps on both sides. And if we could move it over to the side of the camera, oh no, we'll go to the back of the camera. So on, on the back, we've got all these different buttons here as well. Uh, we've got a magnify button. If you're in the right kind of uh, focusing mode, you can actually magnify in to just double check your focus. And obviously when you're playing back your images, you want to hit that to zoom into them. The, we'll start over here. We've got the rate button, so if you're Playing back, you can press that to add a star symbol to your uh, images, so you have a one to five star rating system. And if you press and hold that button, if you've got it set up, you can actually add a voice caption. That's what that little blue microphone is there for. Um, and that voice caption is paired up with that image, and you can bring it onto your computer and you can just uh, play that back and remind yourself of what you were doing or whatever you want from that image. This is often used within the sort of sports and press photography um, area. That way they can, when they're sending off images to um, their editors, they can actually send it off with that voice caption so that they can very, add, very quickly add a memo or a caption to the image um, and they know what's going on and what's, what's in the image to give it a bit more context. The menu button obviously brings up the, the full menu. You've got info on the back, so you can that allows you to cycle through different back screens. 
Um, and you can customize this to, a, to an extent as to how much information is brought up in different modes. Um, if you want it to behave a bit more like an SLR, I generally recommend having it on this one. Um, that way, you know, the image comes up in the viewfinder and just on the back you're using the information. Uh, much as it would on a digital SLR. So if you're coming over from a digital SLR, this camera behaves a lot like it in many ways. More so than the original R did. Um, here you've got the Q button. That brings up uh, this menu if you're in this screen. But if you've cycled through on the info and you're in this kind of screen, you hit the Q button, it'll actually just bring up the menu on the sides, which doesn't have as many options, but there are much of it is duplicated. It's everything you need for most uh, uh, quick access um, settings changes. Um, you then have the play button and the delete button as well down the bottom for obvious uh, things as you're going through the images on playback, you can then delete them. Um, the rate button also I think can be customized if you don't use that much. Now on the top right hand side you have uh, a star button. Now the star button is exposure lock, um, the auto exposure lock. So when you're in a mode where the camera is doing the metering, um, you can meter for a certain area, lock it and then recompose for example, or if the light's changing, you can lock it and then take the picture when you're ready. Not everyone uses this very much um, and I often recommend using this button as a, a, a customization uh, tool. You can use this to, to customize it to something that's a little bit more useful um, because it's often a button that kind of gets ignored. Uh, the, the top right button here is the focus mode, so you hit that and you've, it'll bring up a little menu that shows all the different focusing groupings Oops. and you can cycle through those. We'll get to the focusing a little bit later. On the right hand side of the camera, in the grip, you've got the battery compartment, uh, sorry, memory card compartment. In here you've got two slots, you've got a CF Express card slot and an SD card slot. Now it's important to note the CF Express is not the same as CF. CF is a slightly older format. CF Express is much faster, a bit physically smaller than, the, the, than CF. And it's also important to note that XQD cards won't fit, uh, won't work within uh, CF Express card slots. The SD card slot is UHS-2 compatible, so you can use the sort of higher speed uh, UHS-2 cards, as well as any older, slower card in there as well. The slower the card, the, the less you're going to get out of this camera. You, you kind of need to go for a slightly faster card to get the best out of the sort of high speed frame rate um, and higher frame rate video particularly. You can't use the 8K RAW without using uh, a CF Express card uh, in that slot. The sheer amount of data doesn't allow you to get it onto the card quick enough on an SD card. Uh, you need to have a, a, a card that can keep up. On the bottom of the camera we have um, uh, the battery compartment and you have the LPE6 batteries. The ones that come with the uh, R5, the newest type of these batteries, is LPE6NH. The NHs are a higher capacity uh, battery that give you the best out of this camera and keep it running for a bit longer. The N's will work fine in this camera as well and the LP6s will work but you will uh, not perhaps get the full sort of high speed frame rate um, with the LP6s. It just can't power the camera quick enough to keep up with that. You'll also notice here there's a little uh, socket um, there and that is a data um, socket that sort of is for controls in the battery grip when you attach the battery grip here. So you remove the battery door, there's a little catch there. You can remove the battery door, you can attach grip in here and you can have two batteries in it that give you more controls. Um, and there is also a secondary grip for this camera which is a WFT which uh, adds Wi-Fi capabilities and that also plugs into that same socket. Um, I'll just put this back. Nice and easy. So I've got uh, this plate on there, it's just a, a very stable plate for um, attaching to a tripod. Uh, on the front of the camera we have a um, cable release port, so that's, for, that's our 3-pin uh, cable release port. 
which just screws in there if you've got one of those. That button there is, is actually a depth of field preview button, but again, depth of field preview is something that, that isn't that used or that often anymore. Um, so I often recommend customizing that to something uh, a bit more useful. And it's particularly useful because it's on a, on a finger that is otherwise doing very little. So you can very quickly press that button to bring up a, a menu that you like or um, you know adjust something very, very quickly. And then on the side here, we have the release for the lenses. You'll notice that because the camera's on, the shutter is ex uh, the sensor is exposed. Uh, I don't know if you can see that on that camera. There you go. Um, if I turn it off, the shutter comes down, protects the sensor. Um, a really useful feature on this camera. So I do recommend that you turn the camera off before changing lenses. And generally, don't change lenses with the camera facing up like that. It's not good practice. Um, you should do it like that, so dust doesn't go into the sensor. Uh, on the left hand side, next to the screen, we have the ports. So you have, on uh, this bit you have HDMI and USB-C, and then on this bit you've got uh, headphone and uh, microphone, and then down the bottom you actually have the PC Sync that I mentioned earlier, uh, PC Sync port. So the PC Sync is for um, connecting flashes, um, but it's it's an old older way of doing it and isn't often done in anywhere other than studios where you're using a, a physical wire to the flashes. Most of this is done wirelessly now. Um, the USB-C you can actually use to power the camera and charge the camera if you're uh, not using it and also connect it to the computer to um, pull off your images. The HDMI out is for, um, you can connect the camera up to the TV and review your images if you want, but also it's for uh, sort of pulling out uh, better quality video to an external recorder. And you also have uh, the microphone port there for adding in external microphones for better quality audio in the videos and a headphone port for monitoring that audio. Of course, the other thing I didn't mention was this, the very angle um, screen. So you can bring that out, flip it around um, and if you're not using it, you can actually flip it around and close it as well. And that protects it when you're not using the camera. So now, let's get to the menus. All right, to go through the menus, what I've done is I've connected up my uh, R5 via the HDMI into a capture card that's gone into my computer so that I can show you the menus as I go. Um, it's a much better shot than you know trying to capture over this little camera above my head. So I'm going to start with the modes, uh, the shooting modes, because there's one new one um, you'll notice in the camera. So you've got fully automatic, FV, program, shutter priority, aperture priority, and manual. Bulb, C123. So um, in the, the, the new one here is the FV. So flexible priority, uh, auto exposure. Basically, it's it's like having um, all of uh, shutter priority, aperture priority, and ISO priority now in one mode. So with the FE, what I can do is I can have my uh, shutter speed set manually, or I can bring that all the way back down to automatic. I can then move across to uh, aperture priority, have that set on manual, or go to automatic, or have a combination of different things going on here. So I can have those two on uh, manual and then just leave the ISO on automatic or I can even do which is quite unique to this mode I can have the ISO set to a specific thing and then everything else on automatic so uh, the camera takes care of the, the overall exposure but um, what I'm doing is just setting certain things in uh, manual because I want that to be a specific value and you might want to do this for just creative control or because you know that for that particular image you want to have uh, a particularly low level of noise. Um, you know, I don't particularly use this mode. <clears throat> I don't particularly use this mode very much, um, but it's there because uh, it might be useful to somebody <laughs> somewhere. So let's go through the menus. I'm going to start with the camera menu, the red menu. Uh, we'll go with camera one and we have image quality. We can go in here and set the image quality that you want. You've got raw and compressed raw. Compressed raw is just a sort of smaller 
raw size. Um, it's not going to give you quite as much flexibility as the full raw, but it reduces the amount of memory it takes up on your, mem on your memory card. Um, I tend to leave it in full raw, and then on the bottom you have JPEG. Now if you put them both on, you can have raw and JPEG saved onto the card. You can separate out which card it goes onto if you want to. I've only got one card in, so I can't do that. And that's done from a different menu. Um, you can have just JPEG, or you can have raw and JPEG. I tend to leave it on raw and JPEG. Dual pixel raw. Um, this is something you can enable if you want. Um, it is by default disabled. The reason being, it does slow the camera down quite significantly, um, and it does take up double the amount of memory on the cards as uh, a normal RAW. Dual Pixel RAW takes the information from both sides of uh, the Dual Pixel AF system. So Dual Pixel AF system works by having, uh, essentially, on every pixel, two photo sites. So it uses a, a left and right eye on every pixel, and then it combines that information to give you a single image. But because you've effectively got double those photo sites, um, you can have uh, an image that's much larger in size um, in terms of memory. It's not bigger in size of resolution because they're slightly different um, angles. So you get a slight parallax error with these. But what's interesting about this is you can use it to um, adjust certain things in post-production if you're using uh, the dual, if you're using the uh, Canon's Digital Photo Professional. What's quite good about the Canon menu system also is that you can actually hit info and it gives you some information about each, each thing. Um, so what you can do is with the Dual Pixel RAW is you can adjust things like uh, your bokeh. So you can adjust, you have a slight lateral shift in bokeh. You have the option of just moving the point of optimal sharpness. So if you're using very shallow depth of field lenses, you can potentially get the sh point of sharpness from the eye eyelashes to the eye, for example. Um, and there's the option to um, adjust the uh, ghosting and flare as well. So you can potentially reduce ghosting and flare. Um, I don't tend to use this mode very much. If you're using very shallow depth of field lenses, it can help uh, a little bit. On this camera, actually, you can go a little bit further. You can adjust the um, clarity as well. And that's a function of the dual pixel raw system. Right, so I'll go down to uh, cropping and aspect ratio. This allows you to uh, go put the camera into 1.6 crop mode. If you're using EFS lenses with the adapter, you can actually use those lenses on here as well. Uh, and it goes into the crop mode. It should do this automatically if you're using a Canon uh, EFS lens. If you're using a third party one, you might have to do it manually. You can also put it into um, one to one, four by three or 16 by nine if you wanna shoot in slightly different aspect ratios. Uh, if you're shooting in RAW, what it'll do is it'll just keep that as a, the full image, but it'll just um, it'll essentially give you bars. So if you bring it into DPP again, uh, what it'll do is show you the aspect ratio you picked. Um, but in JPEG, you are stuck with the aspect ratio you pick. Most people just leave it in full. Moving on to uh, camera two. So we have exposure compensation. This is um, allows you to adjust the exposure compensation. So uh, if you think the camera is going a little bit too dark with the automatic exposure, you can just push it up a little bit. And you can actually now uh, using two different dials. So on the back dial, you can do the exposure compensation as the sort of baseline, and then use the top dial to set up exposure bracketing. So you can set up, essentially the camera will take three shots, um, one brighter, one darker, and then one correctly exposed. So ISO speed settings, you can go into there um, and for the top one, it's much quicker just to use a dial on the while you're shooting, but the you can actually limit the range, so you can reduce the range that, of ISOs that are available, and you can increase it as well. So you've got low 50 there, and on the other side you can actually go up to 102 400, so 102,400. You can use this to limit the range so that you don't go too high. If you consider um, some levels of noise too much, you can actually just limit that as well. And if you're using the auto ISO, you can limit how high the auto ISO is allowed to go. Um, and in the auto modes, you can actually set up a uh, sort of 
the minimum shutter speed needed. So if you know you can't hand hold slower than a 50th of a second, you can go in there and, and, and set up specific um, shutter speeds. So here we have HDR PQ settings. Um, this is a high dynamic range. The PQ stands for perceptual quantization. Um, for most people, this is not really necessary. By default, it's set to off. Uh, what this does is if you're shooting in HEF format, this gives you a high dynamic range um, standard image. It's able to show more colors and more depth to an image and sort of smoother gradation in your sort of color range compared to using JPEG or standard def uh, image. This is becoming more of a, a thing in TVs and, and in the video world and it's sort of moved over into the stills world. For most people this isn't really necessary. So in here, if you do want to use it, you can turn it on here. The, the, the thing is that the, the camera can't display a full, the full range of HDR. So here we have, in, while you're shooting, it can um, set up the view assist, basically setting up the camera to look as similar to how it would look as a, when you're displaying it on a HDR display. Um, so it sort of emulates that a little bit. Just something to note, when you set the camera up to HDR PQ, it will set up uh, use in HEF rather than JPEG image file format. Um, so you'll notice that when I go across to image quality, uh, there it is HEF instead of JPEG um, along with the RAW. HEF is a 10-bit file format, It's whereas JPEG is an 8-bit file format, so you're getting much more color information and a lot more depth to the image, as well as it being a smaller file format. HEF stands for High Efficiency Image F Format, or Image File, something like that. The slight downside is that not everything supports HEF yet, but hopefully we'll get there. But just so you know that there's both options. Uh, auto Lighting Optimizer, you can use this to um, set up, basically the camera will automatically pick out the subject and, and try and light that subject a bit better. So particularly in portraits, if they're lit quite heavily from behind like I am here, it'll, uh, it'll try and boost the lighting a little bit on their face. Um, I tend to leave this on low or off personally. Highlight tone priority, you can do this to uh, basically try and preserve the highlights, the particularly blown out highlights. Again, I tend to leave this off. It's more useful in the video side of things where you're, you don't have quite as much flexibility to adjust this later. I then might stick highlight tone priority on. Anti-flicker shoot, this is quite clever. Um, what it does is with, it, with all artificial lighting, particularly in, in indoor, in your home and that sort of thing, and for sports photography inside, um, what happens is all those lights are flickering and what the flicker shoot does is when you're in burst mode, it will try and pick out the peaks of that brightness every time. So it'll slow down your high speed burst, but you get consistent results because otherwise what happens is you, you'll, you'll take shots and they'll be at different points in, the, in, in that sort of uh, wave and you'll get different exposure values and you, you'll get very inconsistent results. So what this does is picks out the peaks and shoots at that point every time. Down the bottom you have external speed light control. You can go in there and you can set up the uh, functions for the external speed lights. Personally, if you're using the STE3, I prefer to use it, the controls on top of the STE3. Uh, we can go in here, you can turn the flash on or off. You can uh, set up a flash priority or ambience priority for the ETTL balance. So if you're using ex automatic exposure for your flash, you can have it um, take into account the ambient light a little bit more. So you want the warmth of candlelight, for example, or you can have it more flash uh, based. So it takes over by using a little bit more of the flash or somewhere in the middle with standard. And something new to the R5, um, the R5 and 6 were the first to do this. You actually have ETTL2 metering um, as basically having a face priority. So if, if your camera picks out a face, it'll use that information to prioritize that for the lighting of the flash and the power of the flash. Um, otherwise you have evaluative and average, which is um, sort of standard uh, options. Um, yeah, so here you can set up the slowest synchronization you want to set up your flash to. I never change this to be honest. Um, so flash function settings, you can go in uh, to change the flashes menu settings on the back of the camera here. You have to have your flash connected to do so and then you can clear the settings down the bottom.
All right, uh, red menu two, camera menu two, uh, three rather. Um, white balance, you can set the white balance here. And if you want to set up a specific Kelvin value, you can do that in there. You'll notice you've got all these different modes, which are pretty standard. And at the end, you actually have uh, auto white balance, but you have white balance, white priority or ambience priority. Ambience priority takes into account, again, that sort of uh, ambient light and the color of the ambient temperature of the room. And white priority prioritizes what it's, you know, what it thinks is absolutely correct white. Um, I tend to leave that on ambience priority. I think that looks a little bit more natural, but um, I, personally, I tend to use a, a set Kelvin value. So custom white balance, you'll notice that there was that option there on the modes. You can actually pick an image from your memory card, set a uh, custom white balance based off that. So it's an automatic based off that single uh, image and then um, use onwards and this is useful if you're using grey cards so you can set up a uh, a white balance based on a, a a known value if you like very useful for studio photographers white balance shift you can actually shift the uh, the, the temperature and the colors of the white balance if you use shooting rule this is is not that um, useful color space now this is something that does offer up a little bit of confusion to people um, what color space should you be using it sort of doesn't matter. So if you're shooting in RAW, it doesn't matter. You can shoot in uh, Adobe RG or, or sRGB. The file size stays the same and the file stays the same. You can, and you can sort of change that uh, afterwards. However, for most people, I tend to recommend just leaving it in sRGB. So that's what, what when you bring it into Photoshop, it'll automatically just re read that as sRGB and, and you'll work in that color space. Um, and if you're dealing with images for web, the internet works in sRGB, so just leave it in sRGB and it'll export in the colors you're expecting. If you export it and you're using it Adobe RGB, which is a much bigger color space, so uh, sRGB has a certain number of colors it can do. Adobe RGB is a much larger color space. In that color space, um, because it's then, once you export it and you put it on the internet, everyone's uh, browser is going to deal with this slightly differently or you know, each website's going to deal with this slightly differently and it's going to try and pull those colors back down to an sRGB color space, which, you know, can give unpredictable results. So you don't have that much control of what your image will actually look like. So I really recommend having it uh, exporting, at least in sRGB, if it's a web. If you're doing print, you might want more color space because, you know, you've got more colors to play with with a printer than you do with most monitors. So um, Adobe RGB can be useful there. Um, picture style. This is quite uh, an interesting thing. So this will apply to your JPEGs. It will apply to your RAWs to an extent. If you bring it into DPP, the Canon software, it will read this. But um, if you're bringing it into um, Photoshop and, and Lightroom, it doesn't actually read the, uh, well, it'll, it'll sort of ignore this. Um, and you'll, you'll get their interpretation of what the RAW should look like. So if you're shooting in JPEG or HEF, um, this will, will definitely apply. And you can set up to auto or you can set up to standard. And portrait will uh, be more um, sort of flattering on skin tones. Landscapes are a little bit more punchy in the greens and the blues. Um, fine detail just increases like micro contrast. Uh, and neutral and faithful tend to be very, you know, very pared back, just as close to what the raw will look like as possible. So that's what I tend to use. I used to tend to use neutral. So the issue is that when you're um, shooting and you kind of look on the back of the camera you think oh that looks fantastic and you bring it into the computer and it just looks a bit flatter it's because you're using a picture style you might not know you are but you, you, you're using a picture style so if you set it up to neutral or faithful it'll show you on the back of the camera what it will look like when you bring it into photoshop as close to as possible you also have monochrome and you can set up your own down the bottom as well clarity um, this will apply to your sort of half and JPEGs, um, less so in the rules, Photoshop will ignore it. <clears throat> so lens, lens aberration correction, this is quite interesting. So the RF system, all of the um, corrections are sort of stored inside the lens. Um, and with the EF lenses, the, the older lenses, you can download, uh, well, they're, they're sort of stored in the camera you can apply correction. So no matter what lens you're using, it's not never gonna be absolutely perfect. So what this does is it just, um, it 
correct for those sort of things like peripheral illumination correction is that vignetting. Um, digital lens optimizer is you can set that up to um, standard or high. This used to take a lot of processing by the camera and slow the camera down, but it doesn't on, on the R system at all anymore, uh, which is great. And you can set up distortion correction um, as well, if it's available. I tend to leave this as default, um, as distortion correction off, peripheral illumination correction on. But again, when you bring it into uh, Photoshop, if it's raw, it's not gonna make the biggest differences. It's not gonna make any difference. So camera four. Long exposure, noise reduction. Um, when, you're, when you do a very long exposure, the sensor sort of heats up and you build up quite a lot of a lot more noise than you would otherwise, so you can uh, enable this to reduce that noise. And high ISO, high ISO speed noise reduction, so when you push up the, high, uh, the ISO to quite high levels, you bring in noise, obviously, so this just uh, is the compensation for that. Again, if you're in RAW, it won't make a difference. Um, and then dust delete data, you can actually set up, you can actually take an image to show where the dust spots are on a sensor and then ha have the camera automatically remove them. Most people don't use this. Um, camera five. All right, so multiple exposure. Here we have, uh, we're, we're allowing the camera to take multiple pictures in and combine them into a single image. Um, you can set that up to continuous shooting or just to do it once there. Um, and the, the type of uh, control that it has, so um, the, the type of blending that it uses. Um, to be honest, it's mostly worth just experimenting and seeing which one you prefer. You can set up the number of exposures to combine, uh, set up how many times you do this. So you can do it for one, one image or you can do it continuously. Um, you can actually have it save all of the individual images as well as the resulting image. Uh, however, if you don't want to store all of that, you can just have it just save the, the finished image as well. Um, you can also select the starting point, so you can go in and take an image that you've already shot that's on the memory card and then start with that and then overlay another image um, as you go, which is pretty clever. HDR mode, this is different to HDR PQ. So HDR mode, this is taking multiple images and combining them to give you even more dynamic range. Um, we can have it set up to sort of one or two stops or three stops below and above uh, the correct exposure. Um, you can then set up the sort of the style in which it blends those. Um, anything beyond sort of natural tends to be, is very stylized. So just uh, have an experiment, but then they're not particularly aesthetically pleasing. Um, how many times it does it, but you just continually do uh, HDRs or you do one shot just the once. Um, auto image align is very useful, so it'll basically, if you're not using a tripod, it'll just line them up a little bit better in case you've so your hands are moved slightly. And you can, again, have it save all the images that you just did or just um, the resulting image. Focus bracketing. This is, if you're wanting to stack a set of different focus depths, uh, particularly for macro photography. So if, you're, if you've ever shot any macro work, you'll notice that the depth of field is very shallow. Um, so if you're photographing a butterfly, for example, you'll get the antenna in focus, but not the rest of the butterfly. So what this does, if you've set it up on a tripod, you can do this handheld, but it's easier on a tripod. Um, you can set up the number of shots, so a hundred of them, and you can set up the increment, so how much the camera shifts the focus each time. And then what it'll do is it'll take a picture focused on the antenna, then slightly further down, then slightly further down, then slightly further down. So you've got images of every part of the uh, butterfly in focus. You can then take all of those images and combine them uh, in Digital Photo Professional or your editor of choice afterwards on the computer. It doesn't do the combining of those images in camera. Interval timer, so this is a camera six. Um, you can set up a interval timer. This is essentially like what you would do for a time lapse. You can set up the number of images you want the camera to take and how regularly you want, them, want it to take that. So you can set the camera up to take a picture, 10 pictures every 10 seconds, for example, is how it's set up at the moment. Um, you, to adjust it, you go in, press enable, and then you want to go hit info and you can set up how 
regularly you want the camera to take a picture and how many shots you want it to take. I'll disable that for now. Bulb timer is not available in the current shooting mode. If we go over to bulb, we can then use bulb timer. So bulb timer, um, in the past, what you'd have to do is to, you'd have to have like a, a shutter release which has a, a, like a hold on it, or you'd have to just hold the shutter button down for bulb. Um, what this does is allows you to set up an exposure time of your choosing, so you can set up you know, an hour long exposure time, because the camera otherwise can only do 30 seconds, a maximum of 30 seconds. So this just allows you to do the time, set the time that you want. Um, shutter mode, this is another thing that uh, does get confused by people. Um, so shutter mode is the method in which the camera is using the shutter for when you're exposing an image. Um, what by default it's set up to electronic first curtain, and there's very little disadvantage to doing this. You've got fully mechanical and electronic. So electronic is fully silent. There is no physical shutter going up and down at all. The only sound that you might hear is the aperture blades of the lens coming in and out um, if you're not shooting wide open. The mechanical is what happens is that the, there'll be a shutter come down and then a shutter come down to close and, and finish the exposure. And then electronic first curtain is just the, is a fully electronic first bit, then the physical curtain comes down second. Now for the electronic shutter, um, the, the disadvantage to this is that you, you're more prone to rolling shutter effects because it, it's reading like this, line by line by line. A very fast moving shutter, uh, very fast moving subjects can be, can come a, a little bit warped because of that. Uh, for sort of slower moving subject, it doesn't matter. The other slight disadvantage with this can be um, that if you're in artificial lighting, you can get banding where the sort of that strobing effect of the lights uh, shows up in the image. With mechanical, um, this is not a problem. It doesn't happen. Uh, electronic first curtain, this is less of a problem. It just generally doesn't happen. The banding doesn't happen, but the, the, the rolling shutter can happen a little bit with very fast moving subjects. Release shutter without card, I have mine on because I use it, this camera to demo with people, but for the most part, you should have this off. Uh, this will stop it taking a picture if you don't have a memory card in there. Really important because you can be shooting away and forget that you haven't put a card in there and you've just wasted your time. Camera seven, touch shutter. You can enable or disable this. Um, this was when you take, use the touch screen and you press the touch screen and it'll take a picture. I have mine off always because it really annoys me. Image review, um, so when you've taken a picture, it comes on the back screen um, and you can have it come up in the viewfinder as well if you want. Uh, if you want it to behave more like a digital SLR, have this on disable. Um, review duration, you can reduce that to however you want. So if you're in high speed continuous, you can have the high speed display set up to on. This will speed up the uh, refresh rate in the viewfinder to keep up with um, fast moving subjects. Uh, metering timer is the amount of time that once you've metered for an image, it stays at that exposure. Um, exposure simulation, this is as you change the exposure, it shows that it's getting brighter and darker on the, uh, in the viewfinder on, on the back screen. You can turn this off um, if you're shooting with flash because it can't show you what the flash is gonna look like without the flash going off. Um, normally, it'll automatically turn this off when you're using flash. Shooting info display, uh, this allows you to customize what is, how much information is shown on the viewfinder and on the back screen. Uh, viewfinder display format, you can have it Pull in a little bit if you don't see right all the way to the edges. This can be useful if, you're, uh, if you wear glasses because you can't get quite as close to the viewfinder. Um, and you can have the um, display through the viewfinder at a higher frame rate with um, the higher FPS on the smooth setting or power saving, which just you know, keeps uh, your battery life working a little bit longer, consumes less power. Um, and is also still quite natural. I mean, it's it's just not shooting at it, not running at the highest frame rate. So the AF menu. In the AF menu, you have um, 
a lot of options. So this is where it gets a little bit more complicated and I'll show you some setups for different types of photography. Uh, AF operation, you have survey off, AF or one shot. Um, if you're shooting sports and wildlife and anything that's moving quite quickly, you want it on servo. Also, if you're shooting with back button focus, if you do use that back button focus setup, then uh, you generally want it on servo. Um, it just makes more sense. The AF method, so you have face tracking, spot AF, one point, uh, expanded area, expanded AF around, zone AF, and large zone vertical and large zone horizontal. So these, uh, are air, you know, you're limiting areas of the sensor that it's using to focus. Um, now there is a way of setting up the uh, face tracking thing that is better, which I'll show you in a moment. The subject to detect, so it prioritizes animals or people um, or no priority, so we'll just pick out whatever it possibly can. Um, I tend to have that on people because I'm a portrait photographer. Eye detection, I have that on enable. Um, if you don't have that on enable, it would just pick out the face and not the eye, which is also fine. Now, continuous AF, this is different to servo AF at the top. This is when you're not doing anything. So if you're just leaving the camera to do you know, nothing, if you're just waiting for a subject to come in uh, to a frame, if you have this on enable, it'll be constantly hunting for things just to focus on, which I personally find incredibly annoying. So I have this on disable, which will also save some power as well. So this way, if you're waiting for a subject to come into the frame, the camera is where you focused on and not, you know, suddenly deciding to wander off and get distracted. Um, touch and drag AF settings. So this is if you don't want to use a joystick and you want to use the uh, uh, the back the touch screen when you've got the camera right up to your eye, you can set this up to move the touch uh, the the focusing point across just using the back touch screen with your thumb. Um, it is a bit quicker actually than using the the joystick because you can really flick it off to one side or the other very, very fast. Um, but because the joystick's there, and I'm, I'm familiar from, with that from digital SLRs, as many of you will be, I tend to use the joystick. I'm gonna disable that again before I forget. So AF2, you've got manual focus peaking settings. So if you're in manual focus, you can have the peaking. So what it does is, uh, when things come into focus, it gives a, uh, a highlight around the edge of the subject that's in focus and is sharp. Uh, you can set the color of that as well, so it stands out a little bit more obvious. Particularly useful if you're shooting video and you wanna um, do the, the focusing yourself. Focus guides are very clever. So focus guides, when you're in manual focus, uh, it brings up these two little arrows. So with the focus guides, what it does is it uses the dual pixel AF system to tell me if something is in focus. So here I can, uh, it tells me if it's front or back focusing and which way to turn the wheel essentially. So then it, when it's green, it's in focus. Next we have AF assist beam firing. So you'll notice on the R5, you have this little uh, circle on the body just there, um, quite near your finger. Um, what that does is fire off a, a light. So a, a, an LED light turn, turns on to help the focusing system um, focus on something by illuminating it. I tend to have this off actually because um, it, I don't want to be putting a light in people's faces, particularly for shooting weddings, this can get a little bit annoying. And the focusing system on this can, can um, deal with low light very, very well anyway. AF3 is your case uh, modes for the way the focusing system behaves. Now this is only really important if you're in servo and you're tracking moving subjects. If you're focusing on things that are relatively stationary, it's not gonna make a single bit of difference to you. Um, so I tend to recommend people leave it in automatic if they're, if they're not overly confident with it. And then um, if they're not quite getting the hit rate they want on a moving subject to then move into the cases there. You can go in and individually um, adjust each case study, but if you're just getting into this, just stick with what they are as standard and, uh, and experiment with each one and see what works for you first. So what it does is uh, case one is for um, fairly versatile for a variety of different subjects. Case two is for um, tracking subjects where obstacles might come into play. Um, the case three is for subjects that are coming into 
frame quite quickly. Um, and so yeah, and case four is for very erratically moving subjects that are, are, are changing direction quite quickly. So tracking sensitivity, what that does is doesn't increase the speed in which your initial pickup of focus will be. It changes the uh, reaction time of the camera to a change of plane of focus. So if a subject's coming uh, directly towards you, which is quite difficult for a camera to do, you want that on quite high because it's going to change the plane of focus. Why you'd want this on low is if there's an obstacle that comes in between you and your subject. So if I'm focusing on something as it comes across and a lamppost comes in between me and that subject, what I don't want the camera to do is jump to the lamppost and jump back to the subject. I want it to just ignore that subject. Um, so it basically adds a delay of that uh, moment where it, something comes into frame. The acceleration deceleration tracking um, prepares the camera for massive changes in direction or how you know where the subject's going to go. So if you imagine like a hundred meter sprint, that subject is going to go from very stationary to very fast, very quickly. Uh, you want the camera to be prepared for that rapid change. So erratically moving subjects, you have that on slightly higher. AF4. So <clears throat> lens electronic ma um, manual focus. Now this is. If you have lenses with an electronic manual focus wheel, um, you can manually override your autofocus. Um, if you want, so you can just tweak it slightly. I've never needed to use this in this camera. The autofocus is, is far more accurate than I would be able to get them. Uh, so I I'm just never needed it. One shot AF release priority, you can uh, have it prioritize releasing the shutter or focusing. So it might be able to get slightly quicker um, response time from the camera, but it might just not quite get the subject in focus on off the first image if you have it on release. Um, for me, if it's not in focus, it's not a usable image, so I tend to leave it on focus. Uh, switching track subjects, so you can have it, um, if you've got multiple subjects, that, you know, multiple faces for the camera to, to be focusing on, um, how quickly it switches between those different subjects if it sees them. You can have it pretty locked on so that it just stays on one subject um, or you can have it on uh, quite high so it's ready to just switch subjects quite quickly. The lens drive when AF is impossible is just how, whether the camera continues to try and search for things or uh, it just gives up. Um, I tend to leave that on. Limit AF methods so you can reduce, if you don't use certain uh, AF methods, you can just get rid of those so you don't have to cycle through them all the time. AF method selection control, um, you can have it set up to, uh, sorry, when you press the focus mode, whether you have to press the AF, M MFN button to cycle through it or use the dial. Uh, a lot of people prefer the dial. I've kind of gotten used to the button now. Orientation linked AF point. So th this way you can have, uh, when you put it into portrait mode, you can have it set up to go to a different uh, AF point. So when you go in here, separate points for both vertical and AF. So when you go into vertical, you know, it, it sort of makes sense that it would be in a slightly different pl place because your subject is going to be relatively in a different place on the frame. Um, that way it remembers where you placed it from when you're in horizontal and where you're in vertical. Initial servo AF point for face tracking. So this one I think is particularly important. Uh, the, the face tracking system is, um, is great if there's a face or an obvious face for it to pick up on, but if there's multiple faces, which face does it pick? It generally picks the first one, so you have very little control over what it's doing. Um, what I like to have is a little bit more control of where this starts. So you can go in here and set up an initial point, AF point I tend to use the top one um, and whatever you can then essentially you have a single point in the frame you can move that point to wherever you want and as soon as you start pressing uh, focus it'll then track from that point so if you can pick out the person you want and it'll track that person rather than just pick out whatever it wants to it's a much better way of using uh, the face tracking system and personally I think it should be by default Focus ring rotation, um, if you, for some reason, want to put your focus ring backwards, you can do that. Um, RF lens, manual focus ring sensitivity. It, with the RF lenses, you can change the throw on the um, manual focus. So you can very quickly uh, change focus if you want, or just reduce it and make it much smoother. Um, 
You can also increase or decrease the sensitivity of the uh, joystick, or the um, thumb joystick thing, and how quickly it moves the focusing point across the frame. Right, playback. You can protect images um, so that when you press uh, delete all, it doesn't delete the ones you've protected. You can erase your images, you can uh, actually erase a whole range of images, so um, a particular date or whatever you like off the card. Um, you can rotate your images and you can even go in and say if you've re recorded a movie in uh, portrait mode for social media um, you, and it hasn't been uh, applied to that image, you can just change the ro rotation info. So you can tell the camera that that is a portrait movie so that when you bring it into your computer, it reads it as a portrait movie. Um, you can set ratings um, of your images, which can help with selection when you bring it onto computer, and you can even copy images from one card to another. Um, you can set up a print order and uh, a photo book thing. I, I've never done this, and I don't know why you'd want to do it in camera. It'd be much better to do it on uh, the computer. So you can process your rules in camera. So you can actually go in here, set a raw um, and then process it down to a JPEG if you like. Um, you can also do some uh, portrait relighting and background clarity. So this is the, the sort of extra things you get in the R5 that's dual pixel raw uh, processing that you can do in camera. And if, if it picks out a face it'll actually brighten up that face for you. Uh, again with background clarity you can also do that. <coughs> uh, increase the sort of sharpness and detail in the background. Um, you can do all that in camera, you can also resize the image, you can crop the images and you can uh, change from HEF to JPEG in camera as well. So if you've shot in HEF but you need a JPEG to send out uh, for compatibility reasons, you can do that in camera. Uh, you can set up a slideshow, so if you're doing a HDMI out to your TV you can do that from in camera. Um, you can search through your images, uh, set up the how magnified in um, the image goes when you press the magnifying button and how many images it jumps to when you scroll through using the top dial. So you can here you can set up that rate button, how you can customize what it does when you um, press it or when you hold the button. If you don't use the rate button for rating images you can just hold it to um, delete images or you can hold it to, uh, so press it to uh, protect images as well. You can set up the quality of your uh, audio memo. Um, playback 5, so playback information display, you can show how much info is available to you in uh, on those screens. If you don't need as much you can get rid of some of it. Uh, you can also turn on highlight alert, so what this does is if it thinks that things are blown out or close to, uh, it'll show you, so it'll flash on those areas. And you can also display where the AF point, uh, where the confirmed focusing point was on uh, the image as well. So it'll show you a little dot. Um, it'll also, you can have it show a grid so you can check your compositions. Um, with movie play count, you can show the record time or uh, the time code. So if you're working with multiple cameras, you might want to have it on time code. Uh, HDMI, HDR output. So this is whether you're able to show it on a HDR displaying TV, you can actually display it in HDR through the HDMI uh, port. All right, so Wi-Fi, uh, connectivity menu, um, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth connections. Uh, you can go in here and you can set up uh, different devices. So I've got multiple set up on this camera. Um, and you can even go across and set up for computer control, uh, FTP servers, so um, particularly if you're, you know, sports and wildlife photographers, uh, sports and press photographers would do this, where they would set up to send images directly to a server somewhere, an FTP server, uh, often at their agency's desk that will, so they, as they take a picture, it will show up on their desk, or you can have it take a picture and you go through and press set to send a uh, picture. Slightly different to sending it to a smartphone and then sending it over, it's a little bit more efficient. Well, it's a lot more efficient, actually. Um, you can also set up Bluetooth, so this camera has uh, Bluetooth, so you can actually use a wireless Bluetooth remote to um, set off the shutter and you can also use um, Canon's web 
um, cloud service so you can actually upload images as you go to Canon's cloud services. Um, airplane mode if you want all of this off. Not, um, Wi-Fi settings you can go in here and show your connection history. Uh, you can set up the transfer settings for FTP and send to smartphone uh, settings as well so you can actually automatically send all of your pictures if you wanted to. Um, which is sometimes used as a backup but it's it's pretty battery intensive. The Bluetooth settings you can enable that. So what the Bluetooth settings, what you are you want to use the Bluetooth otherwise is Bluetooth is an always on connection between your phone and the device and then when you want to use the remote control from the, your phone it automatically turns the camera's Wi-Fi on, on for you and then uh, sets it all up really quickly. You can also use it to uh, turn the Wi-Fi on and, and, and browse images even if your camera's in the bag uh, which is really clever. Um, you can set up a name for the camera, you can also set up GPS device settings. So the camera doesn't have GPS built in but what it can use is your phone's GPS uh, sensors and then pull that information as you're shooting which is really clever. Uh, you can also set up the settings for image transfer so whether it's transferring JPEGs or HEFs um, when you're shooting RAW. And on the second one you can reset all your communication settings. Okay so spanner menu. Spanner 1, uh, record function and card folder selection. So you can set up uh, whether your midi uh, videos and your stills are sent, sent to different cards. You can set up um, whether you, when you're in stills, whether it, when you fill up a card it goes onto the next card or whether it calls to both. Um, you've got a lot of options here to, to play with. Um, and you can also go in and set up your folder. So you can have it set up a new folder or um, select which folder. So if you're, if you're doing shoots in different rooms, for example, you can have different room in each folder. Um, file numbering, you can set up as continuous or automatically resets every time you put a new card in. And you can also change your file name. So you can go in and set up a custom name that's more personal to you. And this is particularly useful if you're using multiple cameras. Um, format card, so it's self-explanatory, um, and you can set up the auto rotate. So on camera and the computer. So if you've taken an image in portrait, you kind of want it to show in portrait on the back screen. Um, this will allow you to do that. If you have it off, it just gets annoying because you have to view it in portrait. Um, but having it on 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 the computer and on the camera is good. Particularly, you want it on on the computer so the computer knows which orientation the image was shot in. Um, you can have it automatically add the rotation info, whether it's portrait or landscape in the videos as well. Um, so if you are doing a mix of stuff for um, sort of social media in vertical, it's worth having that on. Um, you can set the date and time. So spanner two, you can set up your language, pick your language there, um, NTSC or PAL. So this is for American markets or uh, European markets. It sort of doesn't make much of a difference anymore if you're talking about online content. It doesn't really make any difference, but this will allow you to get to the full 120 frames a second rather than 100 frames per second um, if you go to NTSC. Um, help text size. You can change the size of your font if you want. Uh, beep, I tend to have this off because I just find it annoying. So when you get the confirmation, um, Confirmation of focus in one shot. I don't want that beep there personally. Uh, and also when you're going through the menus, it turns off the beep for that as well. Um, head, you can change the volume of your headphones. Power saving modes, what it'll do is uh, just turn the display off if you're not using it um, after a little while of inactivity. Eco mode uh, does just sort of, when you're not using it, really reduces the amount of power the camera's using. So it dims the screens and um, uh, and lowers the resolution of its um, <clears throat> viewfinder just to, on the assumption that you're not doing anything for that period of time so it can save some power. So uh, Spanner 3, screen viewfinder display. What's different about this to the older uh, mirrorless bodies like the R and the RP um, is when you have, by it, default is on auto one, so once the screen is folded out like that, it automatically turns off the proximity sensor that's there so that 
it this screen doesn't turn off when you when something gets close to it because it's sort of assuming if the screen's out your eye isn't going to be close you're not going to want to use the viewfinder uh, the reason for this is if you're using video um, when you set up on a gimbal or you know you're, you're doing awkward angles in video when you get close it just constantly turns the screen off which can be quite annoying so this way uh, is the best of both worlds without having to go into the menu and sort of turn it off manually um, but you can set it up to be manually viewfinder and screen so you can actually set up a button to switch between the viewfinder and the screen if you wanted it to um, i tend to have an auto one you can change the screen brightness and the viewfinder brightness and you can actually change the color tone of both the viewfinder and the screen uh, if you find it's not quite um, true to life to your eye and you can fine tune that as well so you, you the ui magnification thing honestly never use it but you can double tap um, the menu screen with two fingers to uh, sort of zoom into the menu so you can read things a bit better if you're if you can't quite see things very well HDMI resolution so when you're um, putting things out of your HDMI it, you can have it in auto or in force 1080p um, touch control you can have this on highly sensitive this is useful if you need to wear gloves multifunction lock um, which is that lock button at the top which it, this is where it's a bit weird it, that should be in the customized controls bit but it's not so multifunction lock you can choose which uh, things are locked by that in there uh, and whether you want the shutter to come down to protect the sensor when you turn it off you can sense cleaning so it has a, an ultrasonic um, motion to protect this to clean the sensor on power off automatically um, you can turn that off or on if you want um, spanner 5 so reset camera uh, you've got all of the different things to reset the camera I'm not going to do my one uh, but you can go in and, and specifically pick different areas so if you find you can't figure out why something's not working or something's changed just go in and, and do some resets it's not going to you know damage anything just reset the area that's relevant to that um, whatever it is that you can't figure out and that will usually fix a lot of things custom shooting mode so you when i was going through the modes you did see c1 2 and 3 um, you can set up here so what you do is you set up the camera for a custom shooting mode so you set up the camera in a normal mode so in manual so if you want it in, in manual for uh, uh, landscape photography and you set up all the settings you want for that you can then register those settings in here uh, for one two or three as a your landscape setup and then one for portrait setup or whatever you want to do uh, I personally use it for different areas of a wedding. Um, a friend of mine showed me this, that, you know, she'll go in and she'll, different parts of the venue are different, very different settings and setups. So she'll go in and, and set them all up and have them on one, two, and three. If you set on the video mode, when you go into the video and set up one, two, and three, number three is what the camera refers to when you hit the, the record button, when you're in stills. So if you're shooting in stills, hit record, it'll then refer to custom three video. That way you can have a sort of general capture video settings on custom three, and it's something that you know that is what you, the sort of roughly the settings you want. Battery info, it'll actually tell you uh, the health of the battery and how long you've been using it. Um, copyright information, you can set up your own copyright information, which is embedded in the metadata of your pictures uh, in here. This, um, it is easy to set up and you just type in your name. Manual and software, there's just links to the manual for you, uh, which you won't need anymore because you've watched this video. Certification logo display, this is just uh, something that has to have. And in here you can set up your firmware, so you can go in, if you put a card in that has the firmware, you can, you can select it here and it will actually update your firmware for you. Uh, you can see mine is not up to date. Right, the orange menus. So this is custom function menus. In here is some of the stuff that's, uh, you know, just for tweaking things to work the way you want it to. So exposure level increments, if you are um, if you want it to, to sort of shift exposure much quicker, you can go to half stop instead of third stops. Uh, same with ISO, you can go to full stops or third stops. Okay, so after you've done automatic metering, does it just stick to what it, what it was for a while or do you go back to fully automatic? Right, so you also have some options for bracketing. Um, so here you have bracketing sequence, um, whether you want it to shoot the correct image first and then the uh, one below and one above, or which order you want that stuff to be in. Uh, the number of bracketing shots, so weirdly this is somewhere very different to where it is in the uh, to set up the bracketing, but you can have three 
to 5 or 7. Okay, so safety shift is if you're in um, shutter priority or aperture priority, um, what it does is if, if the camera can't go far enough to, to get a correct exposure, um, so your, your aperture is too wide open and things are too bright, what it can do is actually override your manual setting and bring it down a little bit to ensure that you get an image in correct exposure. Uh, I tend to have this off. Same exposure for new aperture. This is useful if you're using, uh, if you then, if you change, take the lens off, stick a, an extender on it and put it back on, it, it'll automatically adjust for the change in aperture that has been caused by that, um, particularly in manual mode. So exposure lock meter mode after focus, as you hit the focus button, um, half press the button, focus button, it, you can decide which metering modes are locked by that. Um, I don't know why you'd want to change that to be honest. Restrict shooting modes, uh, if you're if you don't use all of your different shooting modes, you can actually reduce the number uh, of ones that you want. Set shutter speed range. So you, if you're really not using 30 seconds and you don't want it to have to scroll through all of it, you can reduce those. Uh, and you, likewise with your aperture range. Uh, you can change star direction. So if you're used to a different camera system and they, they, they go in a different direction, you can set that up in here. Uh, same with the control ring. Um, Customize buttons. This is where it gets quite interesting. So, custom buttons. Um, there is, in this area, so much to play with. Um, so for example, let's look at the um, exposure lock button. So I've got that set up to change which, whether I use the viewfinder or the screen, um, switch between viewfinder and screen, because I don't use that otherwise. One thing I like to have it set up to is God, I hope that you can't hear my stomach rumbling on this <laughs> video. Uh, so what I like to have this set up to is metering an AF start. Right, so you go in, I've set that, and then I can press info to set up a detail. And I can change the AF operation. So I can have that on one shot, for example, and I can set up a different focusing group and change the characteristics if I wanted to. And press menu. So that way I have two back buttons. So I have the AF on button there for AF and the second button for AF. So I have two different types of um, autofocus on two different buttons. So I can very quickly change between my modes. All of these buttons can be really heavily customized. Depth of field preview, uh, I often have this switched out to something more useful. For me, I tend to have it on flash function settings. So when I have a flash on, I can just hit that button and change the flash power. Um, the, the really key thing here is that these cameras are designed for everybody out of the box and they kind of don't know the best, most efficient way for you specifically to work. So they ha it has to be done on a pretty generic uh, setup that's functional, but not necessarily as efficient as it could be. So I really recommend having a look through this. The one thing I, I recommend everyone does is down the bottom here is it, by default it's on no function, I recommend the multi-controller, the joystick, on direct AF point selection. So that way when you move your point, uh, move the joystick to move the point, it moves the point and you don't have to press any other button first. Or Ordinarily you have to press the, uh, the top right button first. So definitely have a look through this uh, menu and if you get a little bit confused and you don't know what you've done, um, you can reset all of this very quickly and I'll show you how to do that in a moment. There you go, clear customized settings, that's how you get rid of it. So the custom controls can be much quicker, uh, it's much quicker to access the custom controls from this screen. So you go back to the thing, cycle through info and get to the screen and press Q and you move across the top here, customize controls, get to there, custom buttons. Um, you can customize dials, which one do uh, affects which uh, exposure related thing and on the New RF lenses, you actually have uh, a control ring on the front, or if you have the control ring adapter, you can also do this. <clears throat> and you can set what that does. It used to be on the R system, on the R and the RP, that this had to be a exposure related thing, but now it can be uh, a few other things as well. Um, so you've got a little bit more options of what you can customize that to do. So uh, add cropping information. If you've cropped the image in uh, playback, you can add that to the raw so that when you bring it into Canon software, it notices it and, and, and does that for you. Um, you can set up audio compression on or off. What the erase button does by default, 
Um, release shutter without lens, I tend to have this off because if you have lenses that aren't recognized by the Canon system or are manual lenses, older lenses without a computer chip in it, um, uh, it won't, the camera won't be able to take a picture. So what you might want to do is go in here and turn that on because it thinks that there isn't a lens on it. Um, retract lens when power off. This is interesting. So when you, with some lenses, as it focuses, the, the front element comes, um, comes quite far out. Uh, what this does, when you turn it off, it'll just pull that back in. Um, but in some cases, you don't want the focus to change when you turn the camera off at all. So you can have this, um, you can change this setting. Add IPTC information. So you can actually add a lot of information about um, where the images were shot. Uh, you know, a lot of all this IPTC stuff is, is sort of standard metadata tag. So all of this gets embedded into the image. Uh, when you look at the properties of an image, you can actually see all of this information. Um, to set up uh, this, you need to do it on a computer and send the IPTC data to the camera. Um, and then you can enable uh, and register that information and enable it, embed that into the images. Right, final one is clear all custom functions. That's just to clear that area. And then in the green menu right at the end, that's uh, my menu. This is to set up a my menu tab. What I do is I set up a certain tabs for different types of photography. You might have one for landscape, you might have one for wildlife. You might need to get to different parts of the menu um, for different types of photography. And it's to save you scrolling through all those different tabs, you can just save a few into these uh, customized sections and you can name them as well, which is rather helpful. The last thing to show you is the movie options because if you switch over to the video mode, uh, some of the options in the menu do change particularly here in the uh, red menu. So the movie record quality, you go into that and you can set up uh, your different recording sizes. So at the top, we have um, the resolution. So you have 8K, so what these mean is uh, 8K DCI and 8K uh, UHD. So UHD and DCI are slightly different formats of uh, ultra high resolution. Uh, DCI is slightly wider uh, aspect ratio and is more um, what is used in cinema, a sort of a more of a cinematic uh, look. Second one down is the frame rate you want, 50p, 25p or 24p if you're in the right mode to use it. Um, and then down the bottom we have the quality. Um, so RAW can be shot in 8K. Um, you have all eye, which is every single frame is recorded as an individual frame. Uh, IPB records a single frame and then in the subsequent few frames it records the changes in between those different frames. So this saves on space but does require more processing to power to edit your footage. So all eye if you're going to be editing your videos or raw if you're going to be editing your videos and you want the very best quality. And then IPB compressed, uh, you can only do this in certain modes, I think you can do this in Full HD. Uh, so this is an ultra light um, format. Takes up very little memory uh, compared to the rest, but is slightly lower quality and you'll have very little scope for editing. High frame rate mode. You can go in here to enable uh, the slow-mo stuff. Um, audio isn't recorded when you go into high frame rate. And if you want the full 120 frames a second, as I said earlier, you need to set the camera into NTSC mode. Um, 4K high quality mode. What this does is uh, oversamples the 4K, uses an 8K um, shot, downsizes it to 4K, which does require more processing and can increase the uh, heating up of the camera as well. But it does enable a, a much finer 4K. Movie cropping, you can crop into the video so you're using a full HD in it more of the sort of closer part of the sensor, more of the center of the sensor. Uh, you do this if you wanted a more of a telephoto look out of your lenses without, you know, having to change lens. And sound recording, so you you can have it set to auto or you can manually um, adjust the audio levels. So that's it, that's pretty, basically everything that is on the R5 um, and everything I've gone through on this will pretty much completely apply to the R6 as well. 
and many other Canon cameras that have a lot of the same features because the Canon menu system is pretty close to and very similar between um, camera bodies. Uh, the real key takeaways to look at this is um, for setting up the camera for you to so really customize the camera using the custom controls. There's so much to play with there and it's, it's a much better way of working with the camera or there's potentially much better ways of working with the camera if you, you know, spend the time to actually have a little play in there. So now that's it. Thank you very much for watching. That's pretty much everything there is to go through on the R5. I uh, really recommend you take a look through the custom controls area. That's something that you can really set the camera up uh, more personalized to you and give you a much more efficient way of working. Particularly if you're doing sports and wildlife, having those dual back button focuses is very useful. And also um, changing the way that you use the face tracking system using that initial servo point is a far better way of interacting with the camera.